This is In the Trenches, Broadcast 35. Welcome to In the Trenches, where entrepreneurs, artists, writers, designers, inventors, warriors, and leaders share their stories of doing the hard, creative work that impacts all of our lives. Let the journey inspire you to do something worthwhile, build something bold, and create your life's work. And now, your host, Tom Morgus. Welcome back, everyone, to another broadcast of In the Trenches. Today's guest is Doug Geiger, who is the founder of CanYouHandleBar.com and a senior project manager at Saddleback Leather Co., and I'm just really excited to have Doug on the show today, not only to talk about those two brands and what he's done with both both companies, which is pretty impressive, but also uh, there's one one aspect in particular that he's recently talked to him offline about, which was uh, giveaways and how he's leveraging giveaways in his business um, to, to grow his business. But hopefully we'll have time to get into that. But other than that, Doug, hey, thank you so much for being here, man. I'm really excited to have you. Oh, well, thanks, uh, thanks for having me. I guess I take it as a compliment with uh, having read your content before if you uh, have me on the show that says good things about me so i appreciate that <laughs> of course so let's get right to it tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh both can you handle bar and saddleback leather co and kind of where you fit in the mix sure um my background is um worked in the business side of it for most of my career um uh, when i was about 18 years old i started losing all of the uh, hair on top of my head um and those don't really seem like they're necessarily related, but um, I always just enjoyed writing, uh, did a lot of uh, grant writing, um, worked in project management and that sort of thing. Meanwhile, I had this bald head. Um, and so there came a point where I realized, you know what, I want some options uh, on my face. I want to be able to do something to, uh, you know, uh, express my individuality with my hair. And so the only option I really had was my uh, beard and mustache. So um, taking the the enjoyment of writing and talking with other people and, and, you know, uh, some creativity and empathy and trying to think like, uh, understand how other people think, uh, made a lot of sense for me to, um, get into, uh, the web and, uh, have an e-commerce based company. Um, and, you know, around that same time I'd started with a uh, handlebar mustache and, uh, goatee and beard and whatnot. And so, um, in the back of my mind, I knew I wanted to start a, um, eventually I wanted to start a beard and mustache, uh, company, uh, selling products, uh, for guys like me. And I still haven't found a way to make my hair on top grow, but uh, I've got a pretty good beard now and, and mustache. And, um, so I've enjoyed that and I've enjoyed the process. And my wife says now I have, um, better hair products than she does. Apparently my flat iron is better than hers. So I think that's a milestone for me. But, uh, in the meantime, I was also, um, still working, had a day job, uh, working at a big, um, mortgage company in the project management office, but, uh, increasingly I was, um, enjoying the problem solving side of it and not so much the Gantt charts and, um, you know, PERT analysis and all that. And so I, um, as a big fan of Saddleback Leather, uh, I joined with them a little over two years ago and I uh, came in actually as a project manager. And, uh, since then I've switched over to uh, marketing. Uh, and so now I'm the marketing guy over at Saddleback and, um, my company is now, um, about it's in its third year. So, um, you know, day to day I'm, I'm doing both. Uh, they're very supportive of what I'm doing. Um, and I've learned a ton from them before I joined the company. And certainly since then, um, getting to see how a well-run, um, company that really values quality and, um, customer service, how they uh, can succeed, um, in an era where a lot of things are getting cheaper and poorer and poorer customer service. So they've been a great mentor to me. Yeah. So did you, did you, so it, it, just so I, I get clarity on this, it started with, you started in Saddleback Leather, correct? And then you started Can You Handle Bar? Yep. So um, when I was still uh, at the mortgage company, I had the beginning ideas um, to start this company, but it wasn't until I, I switched over to Saddleback that I had the, um, the time uh, from working at home um, as opposed to having a 45 minute each way commute every day. And so that idea was in the back of my mind. And once I started with Saddleback, um, it gave me the inspiration and the time to be able to pursue it. And so shortly after I joined Saddleback, I began King Handlebar. So tell me a little bit about your your work at, uh, before we get to King Handlebar, but uh, your work at 
Saddleback Leather. So what kind of stuff were you doing? I mean, it, it basically, in your Facebook, it says uh, Senior Project Manager. Tell, so tell me a little bit about that, what, what that's like and what that means um, in the context of Saddleback Leather. Sure. Well, you know, it, it, um, the, the smaller the company, the bigger the titles. And so, um, you know, uh, when I joined, um, you know, I came in as the, the, the head project manager. Um, but in a small company, you, um, if there's a problem that comes up, you jump in and you help out with it. And um, when we looked back historically at the problems they jumped in, in on, they tended to be more around um, creativity, uh, uh, outreach to other people, um, and that sort of thing. So it was a natural progression for me to move more toward marketing uh, and messaging for the company um, and not so much um, the Gantt charts and that sort of thing. So my, my resume to that point had been more around the project management. But my um, aptitude, my enjoyment came more from the marketing side of things. And being an e-commerce company, a lot of the projects I was managing were all, already had a big marketing element to them. So it was not as big of a leap as it might seem uh, from like a Fortune 500 perspective. That's a pretty big jump. But in a smaller company, uh, especially when it's e-commerce, it was more logical. And so um, basically, I just shifted my focus over to the actual marketing uh, for the company and away from... Um, you know, keeping up with back-end technology type um, relationships with vendors and that sort of thing. And it was more on, you know, how can we get have our story told uh, to more people? And um, so it's been a really good uh, switch for me. So in terms of some of the stuff you've been doing with them, what are some of the kind of the more creative, uh, you know, avenues that you've you pursued to, to kind of grow and scale? Um, and, and build the brand and build the business? Uh, well, the, the brand is, um, it, it's just a great brand. It's, we just celebrated, uh, 10 years. Um, I, I love the, um, personality of the, the owner. Um, he's one of the, the few people who, when you see him, uh, you know, you see his online per persona, his personality, and then you, you actually get to spend time with him. He's being Dave. Um, he's actually what he seems like. He's a very genuine guy, very funny, uh, smart. Um, and so it's been great just being able to, um, so, so I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not like uh, trying to create something from nothing. It's actually just trying to tell what's actually happening really effectively. So um, just a lot of uh, trying to find ways to, um, you know, make connections between um, the day-to-day -day, uh, customer service stories, let's say, and having people know how hard we work uh, for customer service. Um, the, the quality and the effort and the extra money that goes into a, a given bag um, that people might not necessarily even realize is there, um, telling that story. So it helps when you have a really awesome product and you love the people that you work with. Um, so the creativity has been in trying to um, show uh, prospective uh, customers um, what they would be getting when they purchase the bag and um, trying to find those those folks. Um, you know, one of the ways that we found them is there seems to be a big crossover between people who appreciate, just for example, um, uh, facial hair and, um, you know, everyday carry, um, people who appreciate the quality of the items that are around them. And so we've done a lot of work to um, get in on um, smaller groups of people like beard competitions um, and and really uh, showcase uh, that the, that if you if you have the patience to grow a beard, you probably are the sort of person that has the patience to buy a bag and let it break in. Um, and so that's been really um, really positive. And then some of our our online and social media um, reaching out to uh, groups like, for example, on Reddit who are into everyday carry, um, and our our wallets happen to show up quite a bit there. So doing outreach there. So it's really not trying to create something from nothing. It's more just trying to. Uh, provide people who are genuinely looking for the best, let them know that we exist, um, answer questions and engage people at a, at a small level um, all over the place. Um, one of the other things that we've, we've done is um, really working on um, reaching out to um, specific groups of people that make up our customer base and finding out where they are and, and reaching out to them directly as opposed to having a, a one-size-fits-all uh, marketing message. So those are some of the bigger things that we've done in the last um, year and a half since I've been working with marketing. Yeah, that's great. So, so what have been the the most effective ways to to spread spread the message, spread the word, and uh, and grow your user base, grow your customer base, and and also 
conversely, what's been the least effective for you guys in terms of, I suppose, return on investment for your efforts? Um, could you could you restate that? I'm not sure. I, I yeah, that exactly. So I, I, well, I guess what I'm curious about is when it comes to a company like this, um, you know, great brand. You guys, are, you know, you're you're working toward spreading the word and in market penetration, getting more customers. So what's been effective? What's been, what are some marketing, uh, what are things, some things you've done to get more customers to grow, grow the company in terms of sales and stuff like that? Uh, and then what are some of the things you've probably, you, you may have tried or tested that didn't work so well, that weren't effective? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does make sense. Um, as far as effectiveness, um, I think that with the internet, um, we actually have the, um, a real democracy in the sense that, um, if you were in a small town, say, uh, somewhere maybe 15, 20 years ago, and you were interested in a type of product, a backpack or a briefcase, there might only be two or three brands that you could drive and, and purchase. And so it was kind of like a two-party system. You know, are you going to get this brand or that brand? Now then with the Internet, there's so many more brands that you can get. You can get them from different countries. You can get them from homemade on Etsy and eBay and Alibaba, wherever. And so we really have a multi-party system now where any given product that you're thinking about, um, you have so many more options available to you than you ever have. And so um, one of the most effective ways is to find out who we are and to really be that person. Um, I think that, you know, trying to be all things to all people, I'm trying to, um, you know, pick the thick middle of the bell curve is one of the most dangerous spots to be in because someone can compete with you on price um, very easily. Um, it's very difficult to come up with the sort of content that people share because very few people share something that everyone agrees with, you know, unless it's really funny and that sort of thing. So, um, the, the way to stand out is to find out what's unique about you and, um, and spread that. Uh, one great example is the, um, how to knock off a bag video. Um, it's very much the, the DNA of Saddleback with the humor, um, the attention to quality, um, the uh, just the the fact that we took a risk and when everyone else is is putting out you know 45 second videos we put out a 12 minute video and it ended up getting um, you know recommended by all sorts of people and big magazines and small magazines and, and so it was really different it wasn't something that other brands could get away with but it made sense for us and so the trick is finding out what's that that thing that's uniquely you the concentrate you know the cognac of your brand and and knowing what that is and then sharing that um, at whatever cost there is. You know, there's going to be some people that are turned off by our video, and that's okay um, because there's so many more people that are just, it's just refreshing to see somebody who actually has a, a brand these days and not just a, um, a product they want to sell you. Um, in terms of least effective, um, I, you know, there's not any one big swing and miss that we've had, but um, anything that doesn't have uh, that we don't do with intention, I think I would count as a miss. So uh, anything that you do simply because you're quote unquote supposed to do it, uh, I think is a miss. Most things, there's an opportunity to um, find the way that your brand should be using that tool. That could be through email. Um, if you have a fairly large customer base and you don't have any sort of segmentation, um, that's probably a miss. So if you're going to do email, um, find a way to do it so that people that want to hear from you all the time can do that. And people that don't, can only hear from you once in a while. People who um, only like a particular uh, type of product that you sell, you can segment them differently. So that's an area that we've that we've seen improvement is um, getting more specific and more tailored. So um, I know that that might be kind of a, a dodge, but um, I think any any aspect of running an online business, if you're not doing it on purpose, whether that's your AdWords, your Facebook posts, your email, um, your videos that you put out. If you don't know why you're doing it, you don't know what makes you different, eventually that's just a missed opportunity. So try to do everything you're doing on purpose. That's been the, yeah. the way that we've been circling around and trying to get better. Man, that's a powerful message, though, I think, for anybody. Um, it's something that resonates with me right now and just kind of like taking a step back and taking that pause in that moment to kind of reflect on the actions I'm about to take for something and say, you know, yeah, it does this. Is there is there purpose behind this, or you know, and am I, am I willing to give it the time of day? I think that's important too, because I'm guessing underneath that comment, that statement is to do things effectively and to do it with purpose on purpose. I mean, it takes time and it takes effort and it it uh, takes a little bit more uh, concentration to do that. Is that about right? 
Yeah, that's exactly right. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to, um, if you don't know exactly what you're trying to be, it's very easy to, to just be reactive to whatever is going on. Um, you know, and, and this was, this, this is the same thing with the, um, with my company, with the, with beard oil, there's, there's kind of two major groups of, um, like common, uh, almost, they're not cliches, but almost caricatures of a beard oil company. One is very, Oh, it's that wax stamps. And, you know, it's trying to turn it into this, um, really over the top caricatured, um, exclusive sort of thing. Um, so they're taking the idea of being a premium product that's well made with good ingredients and they're making it just like I say, like a caricature. And the other is to say, Oh, it's just my beard. And so I'm trying to make a really cheap product that, um, that you can, you know, uh, it's not that expensive and they're kind of underplaying everything. And so the trick is with, with a, a company when you're, you know, with, with Kenny Handlebar when I started, my tendency would probably be to go the route of being a really over the top premium company and really try to create that amazing, you know, like when you open a case from Apple and everything's just really beautifully displayed and everything. So that would be my natural tendency would be to go that route. But unless I knew who my target market was and what my, what I was specifically adding to them, um, you can be really inconsistent. You can have an amazing packaging, but terrible customer service. Um, because you're, you're only reacting to things. Where if you know for sure, you know what, my guys, this is what they would want to purchase. It'll help guide you with all of the decisions that you make and, and have a consistent experience across the entire brain with every interaction that you have. And so you, I think you can tell pretty quickly when a company really knows who they are and who they're selling to and when they're simply just um, reacting to whatever was the last article in Fast Company. Um, and so that's, that's the yeah. trick is, is just to have a quiet space in your own mind where you know who we are and, and why we do what we do. And that'll let you let certain fads pass over you. And other ones, you're like, yeah, that really put a point on something I was already thinking. Uh, because otherwise, this is a really stressful game to be in if you're always trying to, you know, you know, emailing every time Gary uh, Vaynerchuk or every time, uh, you know, Seth Godin says something, you're like, we're going to change everything. You know, <laughs> they're great guys. I love what they're saying, but they're really like a seasoning. They're not the entree. You have to know who you are. And then when they say something profound, you know how to apply it already. That's a really good point. I never even thought of it that way. So well, this is a good segue, though, into into um, can you handle bars? So tell me about that. The I from you t- talked a little bit about the idea. So that's mm-hmm. that's there. I, I I kind of understand the why. I think, but but tell me a little bit about you know maybe the why a little bit more, but also the how. Like so, you have this idea, you put it into. Like how, you know, what, what are the first steps you take? So, you, you know, I'm just, like, there's a lot of people out there, I think with, with ideas for things like this, I, I, and not, not like this per se, but they have these like, um, you know, ideas for whatever it is that's in their life that they care about or that they're passionate about mm-hmm. in some way, shape or form. And they like to do something with that. You know, tell us, tell us a little bit about your particular story with, with launching Can You Handlebar and how you went sure. about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you wouldn't believe it now with all of the new brands that have, that have come out in the last uh, year or so. But when I began, there really weren't that many um, beard oil and mustache wax companies. And uh, and so some of the things that motivated me then might not be quite as true now, but that is how that's part of how I got here. Uh, when I started off, um, I found that there were, there were two things that I felt like were missing. One was um, tangible and one was intangible. The tangible thing was um, very few companies were big enough, meaning they weren't distributed in stores. They were just sort of glorified Etsy shops that they didn't really um, do things you'd expect for a, a personal care product. They didn't say what was in it. You, you, know, you didn't know the ingredients. Um, the packaging was, uh, you know, paper labels, which, you know, anytime you're dealing with oils and waxes uh, in, in, in the bathroom or carrying in your pocket, there's just no good reason to have paper labels on uh, a product like this. And so, you know, I'd buy this stuff myself and it would just look terrible. Look at the Petri dish after about a week of carrying it. And so that was sort of the tangible thing was I felt like I could make a materially better product, um, and, you know, and, and, and also be really transparent with what's in it, knowing that, yeah, somebody could, you know, figure out my recipe, but that's not really why somebody buys something is because of the recipe. You know, that's the reason Tylenol still exists, even though you can buy acetaminophen for, um, you know, a quarter or half the price, um, because Tylenol's got a brand story still. Um, and so, so that was the, the tangible part of it. Now the intangible part was, 
I didn't really feel like there was a brand that I would say, yeah, that really explains why I'm doing this, why I chose to have a beard or a mustache. Um, some of the brands were more hipster. Some of the brands were more lumberjack. Some were more, um, you know, blue collar. Um, and there's nothing wrong with hipsters. They bring us great coffee. There's nothing wrong with lumberjacks. They bring us furniture. I don't know. So I don't mind, I don't mind any of these, but they just weren't me. And so from an intangible perspective, I felt like there was a gap in the marketing side of it too. Um, and so when I started my company, the best way I could sum it up is, um, kind of an old fashioned new habit. You know, it, it's, it's taking the best of, um, of, of what we have right now with, uh, new ways to, um, to innovate in really small ways. Like, um, I was the first person to have a flask for beard oil. So you can have a metal flask of beard oil and it's practical in the sense that you can toss it in a dop kit and not worry about broken glass. It looks really cool. Um, you know, a guitar pick to help you get the mustache wax out so you don't get it in your thumbnail. That's something that really you have to have a mu- handlebar mustache to appreciate. That's really innovative. You know? <laughs> so, so I felt like, you know, taking the new parts of, of innovating and then some of the motivation that I had, which was um, this desire where everything is disposable and everything is instantaneous to tie myself back to, um, you know, something that I had in common with previous generations. Um, and so, so I just really liked the notion of, of having a daily ritual, whether it's shaving everything off or putting beard oil in or doing my mustache, there's just something, I don't know, I guess kind of Zen about, um, the idea that, um, you know, because I'm a man, I grow this facial hair and I can do something with it. And, you know, if I went back a thousand years in time, there'd be another guy who kind of looks like me, um, that's doing the same thing. And so there's something appealing about that, given that everything else in life seems to change every you know, two years, it seems. I mean, I, I live in Detroit and it used to be, if you get a job with GM, you're set for life. Well, in my lifetime, GM has gone bankrupt. So, I mean, it seems like nothing, you, you can't take anything for granted these days. And so, so just tying it all the way back to, um, you know, ancient traditions of, of shaving and, and facial hair that, that really resonated with why I grew my beard. And so that old school new habit thing, I didn't see that. So I felt like with a, with a few tweaks in how I do business and then with a clearer focus on why I have a beard and a mustache, I felt like that was enough to say, yes, there's a gap in the market for me. Um, so that's, that's the why. Uh, in terms of the how, um, you know, it was, there was just a lot of learning. A lot of classes in high school I wish I'd paid better attention in. Um, you know, I need to learn how to make the products. I need to learn how to have an online store, um, learn how to do supply chain, contract negotiation, all those things have come up in the course of doing business. And I've been fortunate that I've had some really um, smart people who are willing to tell me the truth and enough self-awareness to realize that, um, you know, I don't know everything and some things I really don't know well at all. And so I've had, um, I've had people help me with everything from graphic design to, um, you know, PR and, um, you know, contracts and everything along the way. I think there's a, a, when you have an idea in your head for six months or a year, and in the first six months or a year, you're kind of doing it one man show. There's a tendency to think to be, to internalize the fact that you created this for nothing and to take that to too far and think that, well, then I'll, I'm the only thing that's necessary to, for this to be a success. And fortunately I was, um, I was smart enough to know that I wasn't smart enough and I've had some great people help me and that's allowed me to have, um, you know, uh, geometric growth rather than just a few more sales each month. So um, that's kind of in the in the broad strokes. Was there anything in particular that yeah. you were? Well, I mean, I'm actually kind of curious about that uh, that that piece of it. But I, I maybe we'll circle back around to that the the concept of of leveraging other people and their skill sets and stuff like that, and sure to to build something better than than you're capable of doing your own. But before we get to that, tell me a little bit about the the first. What was the first product out of this company? Was it the um, the oil in the, um, the flask or, and then, and tell me what, you know, what geared your, or what, what was the thought process that you went through when it came to deciding on what you were going to start with and how you were going to create and ship it? Sure. Um, the first product was the mustache wax. You know, the name of the company is Can You Handlebar? Um, I, you know, I sell a lot of, uh, of beard products now, but there's a special place in my heart for, what might be the most ostentatious of all facial hair, which is the, the handlebar. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's a little over the top. Um, I think some people can wear it well and it's, it's fun. And, you know, at this point, unfortunately it's kind of become uh, a cliche. You, know, you can get 
handlebar mustache duct tape. So that's a little silly. Um, <laughs> it's a little undermining when there's something that you work hard to to do because you think it's uh, pretty cool. And now it's, you know, kids' toys and uh, birthday favors. But uh, nevertheless, that was the, the origin of the company was the handlebar mustache wax. And so, um, you know, so the starting point for that was figuring out how to do it. And so, you know, it took me um, 17 different uh, recipes before I found the the correct recipe. Um, I also came out with two different holds, um, you know, a, a primary and secondary. One's a daily and one's a little bit uh, firmer. Um, and so, you know, there was a, I had a mentor one time and he says, you know, one of the things that's going to limit you is that once you solve the problem in your mind, you've lost some of the motivation to actually solve it in real life. And I knew that was true about me. Uh, and so, you know, once I'd figured out how I wanted to brand it and, and how I wanted to make it, the anxiety, uh, you know, and the, and the apprehension of never having been an entrepreneur and feeling like, oh, well, there's just some people that have that gene and maybe that's not me. Um, I had to overcome that. And so the way that I did that was I went and bought 10 pounds of lanolin. Um, you know, unless you're going to, um, you know, donate it to a small country uh, for um, women who are breastfeeding, there's really nothing that you can do with 10 pounds of lanolin unless you're planning on making mustache wax. And so, um, so that was leveraging my sense of pride, um, and putting it, pitting it against my anxiety and my, um, you know, tendency to solve it in my mind and, and let it go. And so that was a really, um, that was probably one of the smartest things I did was I knew that if I had to look at that lanolin that was on the edge of my desk and I didn't start my company, I would have to either sell this lanolin on eBay um, and it just, you kind of feel like a creeper when you're a grown man selling 10 pounds of lanolin. So I knew I would never sell it and I knew I'd have to keep looking at it. And so that actually kind of got me through that self-doubt phase. Um, no, I mean, I'm sure there's entrepreneurs out there that have never doubted themselves. Um, I'm not one of them. You know, I had self-doubts and I still do, but, uh, fortunately I've, I've kind of strengthened the muscle of how to get over it. And one of the ways to do it is, um, to leverage another vice, which is your sense of pride, uh, against your, nervousness and, you know, pit the two vices against one another, knowing that your sense of pride will win. And so that's what I did to get the company started. So, um, Halloween night, uh, 2012, um, my wife and I were up late making mustache wax and we launched on November 1st. Um, and so that's where the company started and, you know, in the process of developing the mustache wax, it actually, um, actually come across the recipe for the beard balm, which was the next product. And then from there, it's expanded to include uh, traditional beard oils and some uh, other packaging and that sort of thing. Um, and I've, of course, got you know things that I'm got in the works right now to expand to in the future. Yeah. So the, very interesting. Can you can you talk a little bit about now? This is the where I wanted to kind of circle back to as well. Um, this idea of of going from one man show to to leveraging the skills and strengths of other people to help build your company. Um, Tell me a little bit about that process. You kind of alluded to it and talked about it a little bit, but I'd like to hear more details. Sure. Um, you know, if you're uh, if you've kind of spent a lot of time on the internet, you've you've undoubtedly come across how to guides from everything for from you know Facebook ca- campaigns to uh, designing your own graphics to filing LLCs, and um, you know I think there's really a lot of uh, great resources for people that want to learn how to do something themselves, and I, s- I certainly do a lot of that. Uh, still myself. Um, but I think that there's a, a, a sense of uh, pride and, and ownership um, that, that can step in at, at a certain point where, yes, I may be able to, you know, using software that I can come up with, come up with a graphic design that's even better than average, but is better than average what I'm aiming at, or am I aiming at the best it can be? And so sometimes there's a gap between um, someone who um, puts out there's always a gap between someone who can do something proficiently and someone who can do something superlatively. And so I've, um, you know, one example being, uh, the packaging, you know, I designed the first round of packaging and looking back, it was pretty good given the fact that I've not taken any graphic design classes, but it wasn't nearly what it could have been. And so, um, after spending thousands of dollars to, uh, improve it, I'm so glad that I did. I know that it's opening up to other opportunities. Um, so that'd be one example, you know, another being, um, you know, Google's updating its algorithm all the time. Facebook's changing its power editor and its tools all the time. Unless you have a personal passion 
to keep up with these different plat, uh, platforms, um, it's very difficult to be as effective as you could be. And so um, there comes a point where you um, you have to update your internal files uh, that, yes, I'm making enough money that I, I can and should pay someone to do this better than me. We're having the faith that their efforts are going to pay for themselves. Um, and so you have to make that mental shift between saving money and investing. Um, so it's the difference between cutting coupons and investing stock. And there's a mental shift that has to occur once you get to a certain level of profitability where you don't get your biggest payout from having saved a nickel a piece. You get your biggest payout by delivering, you know, a thousand more of them to your customers, even if you had to pay somebody to help make that thousand possible. Does that, does that make sense or is that too abstract? No, I think it does make a lot of sense. I wonder, you know, in the context of 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 doing this, you know, do you do you consider this the success to any degree of of can you handle bar um to to collaboration, to the help of other people? Um do you feel that way at all? Oh, abs- yeah, absolutely. Um Yeah, I mean not to sound like an Oscar speech, but um, you know, you, you can't, you can't have an entire company. I mean, I guess so much you're like Craig from Craigslist. You can't have an entire company. that's entire success is tied to one person. Um, you know, the, there have to be people who, who like you, um, people who are willing to help you out and maybe a piece of advice, or you may end up hiring them part time or, um, that can point out weaknesses in your thinking, your merchandising. You know, that's something that if you do it right um, or if you do it wrong, you, you know, it's, it's so, so I guess what I'm saying is it's not just helping with the tangible things like helping mail something out, helping with shipping. It can also be helping just with ideas like, is it better for me right now to come up with another scent of beard oil or is it better for me to um, go after a new vertical of shaving products? Well, those are the kind of decisions that it may not take somebody days and days of helping you to do. It might just be one idea that they have, but sometimes it's their expertise. Sometimes it's their time. Um, but you have to have these people or else you could, you have to get lucky. Let me say it this way. Unless you have smart people, um, creative people around you, you have to get lucky with every single decision. I don't find that likely that you're going to get lucky with every single decision in the long term. So if you're planning on like a one stop thing, like, Hey, the Super Bowl's coming to town. I'm going to make some unlicensed Super Bowl hats. You don't need a lot of help with that. You just go and do it and hope that you make your money before the lawyers come. That's not a business, though. Uh, a business is that you intend to be here in five years, ten years. You'd have to get lucky on every single decision to do it yourself uh, in, a, in an ever-changing world. So I have to have experts around me because I, I, you know, I can't keep up with all this stuff. Yeah. There's just too much data to process. So real quick, how do you how do you surround yourself with those experts? Or how do you find that that group, and and how do you know like wh- whom? Because you mentioned the expert, I assume then you don't just take anybody's feedback, e- uh, you know, equally, but that there's probably certain people in certain positions, you know, based on the question that you have at hand or the the problem you're struggling with, that you want to lean into somebody in you know who has expertise in that that area. But how do you find these people? How do you, I don't know, how do you develop that relationship so that they they do support you, that they they can help you? Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. That's I definitely. <laughs> I've made some bad calls before. Um, you know, I worked with a company that was going to help with Facebook ads, and um, it was a, a total failure. Um, so I've definitely had some help that wasn't that helpful before. Um, but um, no, the way that I surrounded, I got some great advice from a friend of mine. I actually worked for him um, several years ago, and um, and actually it was his approach to networking. And networking is kind of a it's a necessary evil. I think it's kind of gotten a bad rap. But um, but networking, uh, getting to know other people. Uh, is a really important skill. Um, you know, you don't build your network when you need it. You build it before you need it. So the best piece of advice he, that he gave me was, um, don't try to find things for yourself. Try to find things for other people. So if you go to a networking event, your goal is not to get your business card into as many hands as possible. Your goal is to understand what people within that, in that room need and introduce them to one another. And so what that does is when you, when you introduce two people, both of those people are thankful. And then when they see an opportunity for you, both of them look forward to the opportunity to pay it back. And so 
instead of being like a dog and running up to everyone and licking their hand, it's more like being like a cat and not really trying to push people into helping you, but simply try to provide value for them over and over again. And I think some people have a sense of a debt that they want to repay. Some people um, just want to make sure that they keep you happy so that you'll keep helping them out. And so I've been fortunate that um, I had this mindset to um, try to deliver value to other people long before I ever needed anything myself. And, and, and also, it's just a decent way to live. You know, if, if you can apply your creativity to helping out a friend of yours and you don't have anything to, to gain specifically, assuming you're going to be friends with them for a long time, you know, the universe seems to have a way of, um, of taking care of people. And so, you know, if, if you were to, to take just person X that was considering starting a business uh, and they wanted to launch in three months, for them to go out right now and, and try to make friends with somebody so that they would help them out, First of all, it's disingenuous, and most people can see right through it if they're talented at all. Because if they're talented, they've already been approached by lots of people that haven't helped them. Whereas if they were to try to find ways to help other people, they're actually creating an ecosystem. They're bringing their own oxygen to the room that they can then breathe later. And so, um, so the most important thing, and this is the way that I've, um, you know, either even gotten my job at Saddleback was, you know, lead with value, lead with helping other people out. When it comes time that you need something, you don't need to beat around the bush. Um, you can simply ask for it, and it makes sense, and, and it's not groveling. It's just asking, and if they say no, they say no. Uh, you still did it because you wanted to do it, but time and time again, um, I've found that people, they, they do business with people that they like, and they like people that look out for them. And so when it came time for me to start my business, there were already several people that I have a long-term relationship with that, um, that I'd tried to help before. And, and um, there was kind of already the, the I, I use the word again, an ecosystem of talented people that had different skill sets that I'd known for years. And so then when my business started, I was able to, to already know who I would go to to have help me out with different things. But the, the plans had been laid for that um, a long time before. And there are people that I've helped that I'll never get anything from, and that's okay. And, and likewise, there's people that have helped me. But I, you know, this this idea that you that you're taking, 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 I think that's uh, poisonous because you you how's the expression go? You can shear a sheep many times, but you can only skin it once. Um, and, and so if you're just looking to take, and 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 you don't really have a way that you're giving back, and you're an entrepreneur, um, you really shouldn't be one. <laughs> because it's not that's not how the world works, um, and you're just a, a fly by night. That's awesome. So, and and by the way, I know we're 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 35 minutes in this conversation. So if you have to get going, let me know. But I do have maybe one or two more questions, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Okay, so I I wanted to segue now into uh, what you're trying to do in terms of getting into retail and wholesaling and everything like that. How are you trying to grow and expand your business? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, right now the the beard thing, um, the the death of the beard uh, has been talked about now for about a year. So um, that doesn't really mean anything. It just gets page views because you, know, you can get people to argue with you. It's uh, it, on those on Gawker. I suppose it's good for Gawker. So they, they'll post something about that, and then all the people with beards will go and complain, and all the while looking at banners. But um, but in the in the retail or in the in the you know, uh, social media world, um, the fad of the beards, I think, I don't think it could get much bigger than it, it's been over the last couple of years. And so, um, having said that, the, the retailers, brick and mortar, um, it's still new that they're, you know, the, the, the people that, that have been going to beard competitions for the last several years are not mainstream. You know, your barber down the road is much more, um, they're not early adopters. You know, they've, they've got a, a fairly stable, straightforward business. They don't hop on every trend that comes along. Um, but what that means is that even though um, many of us in social media may, may be tired of uh, hearing about beards and uh, all the silliness that, that gets posted about it, um, it's still a pretty fertile market for brick and mortar. And so um, one of the things I decided early on was to um, continue to be very active online, but to focus uh, as much effort on um, on brick and mortar. And so a lot of the investment was in scaling my production capacity and also um, making sure that I had 
uh, proper barcoding so that I could be distributed um, internationally with all of the, um, you know, legitimate barcodes um, on the product so they could go right onto stores, which would position me in a way that um, for a brick and mortar that's like, you know what, I've had five guys come in this week that have asked about beard oil. There's a company that's ready, um, that's professional, that's well-made, um, and if they're a chain, I've got, you know, I can, I'm, I have the capacity to deliver to them. And if they have a point of sale system with a barcode reader, I have that too. There's a ton of beard oil makers right now, but most of them are, are small, um, you know, basement garage, um, or, um, you know, Etsy stores, that sort of thing. There's not a lot of businesses that make beard oil well. Um, and so that, that's been one of the, the areas that I've been focusing in, in addition to direct to consumer. Great stuff. What have you found in terms of uh, the greatest struggle that you've had doing that? Um, I mean, that's a lot, a lot of stuff to do there. And, and it seems like you've had a lot of foresight in terms of um, executing. So what have been the greatest struggles that you've dealt with? There's not like a single uh, email <laughs> list that you can email all barbershops. And so there's a lot of just yeah. work, just good old fashioned work, you know, phone calls and, and emails and relationship building and, you know, contracts with uh, distributors and, um, you know, so that's, there's just a lot of work to do, but, um, you know, the, the thing is, is that they, most barbers and salons in, they, they tend to know, you know, someone else in another city. Uh, and so tremendous word of mouth and, you know, giving good, great customer satisfaction, uh, or great customer service, I should say, leads to great customer satisfaction leads to, Hey, you know what? My roommate, um, she actually started a salon in California. I should put you two in touch. And so, um, it's the same thing with, you know, with customers that buy one or two bottles, um, you know, barbershops do the same thing. They know somebody and, um, you know, and then also using the technology there too. Um, so I guess, I guess the one thing is I love bootstrapping, I love entrepreneurship, but bootstrapping is not a religion. It, it's a tool that you use. Um, but, but once you get to the point where you're able to, um, where you grow to the point where you need to, uh, do it in the, you know, quote unquote, official way, um, be willing to, if you, if the growth is there, you know, fine, you know, it, it's great to, you know, you know, you and your buddy sitting at Starbucks late at night planning to take over the world. But if you actually get to where like the world's ready to be taken over, you know, use the, the, the level of tools that are necessary to, um, continue to fuel your growth. So for, you know, for me having a, a CRM system that I can use to keep track of all the different customers and their orders and, uh, and that sort of thing has been really uh, important. Um, and that's, that's beyond a uh, Google spreadsheet now. Um, so now I'm having to keep track of a lot more information and, you know, even supply chain and that sort of thing. So, um, so yeah, cool. I don't even know if that answers yeah, that no, answer the question. It's, but. it's great. I know it's definitely, it's, it's even better. I actually, I love that quote about, uh, sitting in the coffee shop, you know, playing take over the world or whatever. I'm going to have to write that down and quote you on that. But no, I think that's very powerful stuff. So I know we're, we're past time. So I just want to say, um, thank you so much for being on the show. I mean, it was, it was really a pleasure. I learned a ton and I know that the, the listeners did too, Doug, and, uh, this is all incredibly valuable information. So first and foremost, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, of course. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about something I love, which is, uh, business. I love business. And so this is uh, it's always a fun conversation. And people can reach out to you at Can You Handle Bar, um, but any any place in particular you'd prefer them to go? Uh, yeah, they can go to CanYouHandleBar.com. Uh, if anybody's got uh, any questions, um, you know, relating to anything I've said or why should I even use beer oil or <laughs> anything <laughs> they want, they can just email me, Doug, at CanYouHandleBar.com, and I'll be sure to get back to them. Um, I don't hide my email address, and I always try to get back to people pretty quick. So. Doug, I sincerely appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Oh, of course. You're welcome. And that wraps up another broadcast of In the Trenches. If you're interested in checking out the show notes, just head over to tomworkers.com slash podcast to see our latest episodes. Also, I just wanted to give a quick update to fans and listeners of In the Trenches and specifically what I'm working on right now. For the past two years, I've been publishing books, my own and others, through Insurgent Publishing, my boutique publishing company. In the past six months alone, I've helped four individual authors launch their books to bestseller on Amazon, including Dan Norris's The Seven Day Startup and David Nihill's Do You Talk Funny, among others. And both of those books are still top of the charts 
months after launch. I've learned two important things from all this. Number one, that people still read books. And believe it or not, they're willing to pay for the good ones. And number two, the $60 billion book industry is only getting bigger and the barrier to entry is only getting lower. Which means access to this market has never been closer to the average writer, blogger, or author. It is literally within the grasp of anyone who wants it. But you need to know how to approach it the right way. With patience, with a strategy, and with the right implementation and execution. That's why I've been able to launch so many bestsellers, many that are still top of the charts, because we brought great books to the people who wanted and would pay for them. No slimy sales tactics, just honest, powerful marketing. Now, I want to show other authors and publishers how to do the same. Four months ago, I launched the pre-beta to a new super secret platform called Publishers Empire. In that time, I've helped a dozen authors and publishers start to bring their ideas to life. And with their help and feedback, we've quickly developed what is, in my opinion, the best, most comprehensive publishing training platform in the world. And now I'm getting ready to open the doors up to a few more students. So if you're interested in being part of a tight-knit family of publishers who help and support one another through their writing and publishing projects, if you want access to over 100 HT training videos to take you through the writing and publishing process, if you want access to proven copy and paste book marketing and sales copy, stuff that we've used to launch bestsellers, and if you'd like professional book covers and templates you could plug your own work into and look like a pro in minutes, and if you'd like all of that while getting the chance to be mentored by me, check out PublishersEmpire.com and sign up to be notified when we launch. That's www.publishersempire.com. I hope to see you there. As always, this is Tom Morcus. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Thank you for listening to In the Trenches. Your creative work doesn't stop here. Join the resistance, the small but growing army of entrepreneurs and artists putting a dent in the world at www.tommorcus.com. Never fight alone. Join the resistance.